I want to talk to you today about healing the man's mind. Healing the man's mind. If you're taking notes, you can just write that down. Healing the man's mind. How many of y'all know that some minds need healing? <laughs> There's some men's minds that just need healing. If we're really honest, we all need healing in our minds. And I don't know about you, but I could use more of Jesus in my mind on a daily basis. Anybody else, you just, you just need more of Jesus in your mind on a daily basis. If you didn't raise your hand, we're going to have an altar call at the end. And your whole family wants you to come down. <laughs> and your roommates, everybody who knows you. But the truth is, throughout Scripture, Jesus would work miracles that didn't just touch the body but touch the mind. Because he cares more about the inside than the outside. The outside is great, but what good is, it, is the outside if it gets healed while the inside remains paralyzed, while the inside remains toxic, dysfunctional? Jesus would, would touch people's minds and souls along with the body when he did miracles. And one of, one of my favorite stories that Jesus does, it's an interesting story, is in Mark chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you could turn there. And in Mark chapter 5, the, the literal title of this chapter is Healing the Man's Mind in, in my Bible, Healing the Man's Mind, Healing the Demon-Possessed Man's Mind, Making His Mind Right Again. And it's an interesting story because this man is called by all of his neighbors, all of his friends, his community, a demoniac, a, a man who's insane, who's lost his mind. He's doing things that are hurtful towards himself. He's hurting other people. When a, when a person's mind is sick, not only do they hurt themselves, they hurt other people in the process. When we look at the problems in our world and, and the crimes that have been committed and, and, and just the hurts and the wounds that have been inflicted on so many sons and daughters and wives, husbands, so many people, it really comes from just an unhealed mind. The mind is the engine of the actions that the life walks out. The mind is the engine where ideas and, 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 and behaviors and disciplines and and decisions are made. It's made in the mind before it's made out here. And, and so in, in Mark 5, verse 1, it says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Jesus was crossing the entire Sea of Galilee just for one person. No one else gets healed in this story except for this one man. He would cross the ocean just to save one father. He would cross the ocean just to save one husband. He would cross the ocean just to heal one man's mind. Because if you heal one man's mind, you can heal an entire family. If you set one man's mind in the right place, you can heal an entire community. I'm telling you, our world has been impacted by, by men's minds in both good and bad ways. When we look at one of the worst genocides in the world, the Holocaust, six million Jews killed by one man's mind. It all started in the mind of Hitler. The mind is the engine of, of either mass destruction or, or incredible ideas, incredible uh, inventions. I think about Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, everything you see here today started in a man's mind. This building before it was here, it started in Billy Joe Darty's mind. The university you see across the street was in Oral's mind. Oral Roberts thought about it before he did it. Everything starts in the mind. That's why you've got to deal with mental strongholds before you just deal with external issues. You've got to deal with the internal things. This is where it all happens. And, and Jesus crosses the sea. And verse 2, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Every thought that's not from God comes from an impure spirit. We don't want to call it demonic activity. We want to call it depression. We want to call it stress. We want to call it anxiety. We want to call it just a little bit of impatience, a little bit of anger. I got some anger issues. Uh, we want to call it, you know, just like a little bit of trauma, a little bit of PT, wh whatever it is, post-traumatic stress disorder. But I'm telling you, everything that stirs up negativity in your mind or heart is coming not from God. It's coming from a spirit that wants to control the mind of a man, that wants to control the mind of a woman. We don't like to talk about it. We, we feel like that's a little too dark for our American Instagram filtered generation that wants to make everything look pretty and just kind of paint things nice. But I came for the minds of men and women today. This sermon is coming right to your mind. This man lived in the tombs. How do you know a sick mind from a stable mind? How, like, what, what is the line between a stable mind and a sick mind? And there is a spectrum. 
If I could put a spectrum on the screen, I would. I just didn't have time to come up with it. But, but some of us check out in the sermon when we hear demon possessed because we go, well, I'm not that far on the spectrum. I, I'm, not, I'm, like, I'm not living in the tombs, Paul. I'm not in the graveyard. I'm not cutting myself. But maybe you're cutting yourself down on a daily basis internally. So, so maybe you're not over there, but you're definitely not stable. You still feel like you're not good enough. You still feel on a, you, you live in a defensive posture with every person. It's like everybody's in a fight with you. You assume the worst about people. You never believe the best about people. You're suspicious about everybody. You can't trust anybody. Well, Paul, that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of stable. No, it's not stable because stable people learn how to trust people. Stable people learn how to walk in love with people. Stable pe a stable mind is not constantly suspicious on a regular basis. I came for your mind today. I came for your mind today, and I can already feel the enemy is going, don't mess with us. We got a stronghold here. Demon possession looks different in different countries. I remember as a kid in 1995, my mom and dad took me and my brother John to Haiti with them. And when we landed in Haiti, 1995, this specific area, we got out of the plane and my dad said, do you feel that? I said, what? He said, it just feels like there's a heaviness right here. It just feels different. It just feels like there's, there's something different here. And sure enough, we got into the Jeep of the pastors who lived in that area in Haiti. And they said, did you feel something when you got off the plane? And my dad said, yeah. And they said, there, there is a stronghold over our city. It is owned by the witch doctors. They practice voodoo and they, and they cast spells and, and they're angry that you've come this week to do a revival here. They've been trying to move the church out of the city. They hate Christianity and, and they, they, they truly do own this territory. There's witch doctors. As we started driving down the street, the, there was a barricade. They tried to throw rocks at the Jeep we were in and, and they started trying to shake the Jeep and the pastor said, buckle your seatbelts. And we drove to his house and we were at his house and he said, are you sure you want to go through with this Billy Joe, this outdoor crusade? My dad said, yeah, we, we got to do it. We got to do it. I sense now more than ever that we've, we, are, we are here for such a time as this. That night, I watched as demons manifested in people. I'm talking like horror movie exorcists, like people walking on all fours, running faster than a, than a human I've ever seen. And literally, I watched as my dad just started pointing at, at these demonic spirits. And he said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. And it came out. I'm telling you, the world who doesn't even go to church, they, they buy, like horror movies sell tickets because people believe in the supernatural. And demonic possession is real. And it manifested right there that week in Haiti. I remember as witch doctors got saved, people got set free. The territory, something shifted in the atmosphere on that field where thousands of people had gathered in Haiti. I remember going to Uganda, and, and we were there with um, uh, a pastor who had been doing a revival there in Uganda. We partnered with him as a church, and he had been doing a revival there. And I watched as he was casting out spirits, and it was so obvious. And I remember asking my dad when I was younger, I said, how come we don't really have that in America? Like, that, that exists in other countries, but not in America. He goes, no, 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 it just hides in America. It's got a nice masquerade. It hides behind Nickelodeon and Disney+. Plus." and little agendas that they're sneaking into kids at age five, six, and seven. And we don't even see it, it's so subtle, it's just right beneath the surface, just a little bit of demonic activity. And it's coming through the shows, it's coming into homes, it sneaks into Christians' homes, people who are close in church and opening the door to that unforgiveness towards someone. And you might go, well, unforgiveness is not an impure spirit. Well, did it come from God? See, we don't know where this man opened the door, but at some point, he opened the door to impure spirits, and it started affecting his behavior. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. So if I think afflicted, I live afflicted. If I think oppressed, I start oppressing others. The reason he treats you so mean is not because of you, it's because he hates himself. Men take out their hurts on kids and, and wives and women because they have issues with themselves. So, so we try all of our prescriptions and we send all the vaccines in, but the real answer is a, a, an encounter with Jesus that's gonna set a man's mind in a place of healing and right mind and, and, and really set him free from the abusive, toxic dysfunctions that he's operating in. And when you heal a man's mind, you can heal a whole family. Most of the wounds that we have in the room come from fathers, come from men. 
I was doing a study on most of the crimes that have been committed and the criminals that are serving time in prison and jail. It's traced back to a father wound, either a father who wasn't there or a father who was there in a very toxic way. And the hurts that happened and the, the doors that were open to the mind and the anger. And so this man, it says he would go back and forth between the tombs and the community, but often he would isolate himself. He had been chained hand and foot by the neighbors. People tried to bind him, but he would tear the chains apart. He would break the irons off of his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. See, we, we, try to, we try to fix people. We try to contain people. We try to make people uh, live right. People who are on the spectrum of, of, of really mental, uh, emotional unhealthiness, we try to tell them, don't do this. Don't do that. Quit thinking those suicidal thoughts. Quit going. Quit, quit looking at those websites. Quit doing that stuff. You need to get your mind right. And we give them a list of rules and do's and don'ts. And we try to bind them with religion. But religion cannot heal a man's mind. Only a relationship with Jesus. A list of rules and do's and don'ts is not going to set a woman's mind free. It's only an encounter with Jesus. And the church people couldn't fix this man. And the rules couldn't fix this man. And the restrictions weren't fixing his behavior. It was only making him more toxic, more intense, more insane. And he would cry in the hills. And night and day, he would scream among the tombs, somebody save me, somebody save me. And he would cut himself with stones. He would cut himself with stones. It doesn't matter how many nice things you say to a person. If they don't believe it, they continue to cut themselves on the inside. A great sermon, Paul. Great job. You're doing an awesome job. Your dad's well pleased with you. But if I don't believe it, I'm internally cutting myself down. I'll never be good enough. And again, you may not be on the dark spectrum. Maybe you're right. Like you're close to a stable mind, but there's just a few screws loose. You're just one french fry short of a happy meal. <laughs> and you know, like you don't want to admit it, but there's some things that need to be fixed in your mind. You know what I'm saying? If you're really honest, you go, man, why am I so stressed? Why, why do I still deal with the trauma of something that happened 20 years ago? And you don't realize what's wrong in your mind until you face certain things. You might think, I've got a stable mind, and then you become a parent. <laughs> and then your mind gets stable after baby number one, and then you have baby number two, baby number three, baby number four, baby number five, and you're going, Jesus, help my mind right now to walk in peace. You might think your mind as well, and then you face certain things, the loss of a loved one, the rejection of someone, uh, somebody betraying you, somebody saying things bad about you, a, a legal case that goes wrong, something that happens on the job, and all of a sudden your mind starts reacting, and, and you realize, yeah, maybe I'm not as stable as I thought I was here. I, I need God to heal some strongholds, some things that are coming up that remind me of my dad, that remind me of my grandpa things that I thought I was free from, things that I thought I was okay with. And here this man is, he's crying out. Jesus can hear the cries of your heart. What no one else can hear, Jesus sees you. He sees you apart from your struggle. He sees you apart from your suffering. He sees who you can be before anyone else sees it. Jesus already has a vision for your life. He sees the healed you. He sees the restored you. He wants to get you to the other side of the lake. He wants to set you free from those internal wounds. And when this man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. Lord, I pray today that you would speak to us. God, that we would encounter you, that you would set minds at peace today, that you would heal minds of men and women in the room today and online. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Thank you so much. You know, I remember this man who came into my office several years ago, and, and I was studying for a sermon, and this man came running through the offices, and he told the secretary, I need to talk to pastor. I need to talk to Pastor Paul. I need to talk to him right now. And the secretary said, well, there he is. His door is open. <laughs> we learned from this moment just to, to field people a little bit better after this. But he came into the office, and he was angry, and he was wild. 
And he started shouting things at me. He said, the CIA is coming for me. The FBI, they're listening to me. Give me that pen. They have bugged your pen. They are inside the pen. They are listening to us right now. He starts saying all this stuff. And then he said, you know, I served time in jail. And I could hurt you if I wanted to. And I start kind of freaking out in the office. And I start realizing things are not right. At first, it was kind of wild and a, and a little bit funny. And then I became sad for this man because I realized his mind was not in a good place. And I said, can I pray for you? And he kind of looked at me after 15 minutes of saying a bunch of crazy stuff. And he said, yeah, yeah, you can pray for me. And I put my hand on his mind. I said, Lord, I thank you. You've not given him a spirit of confusion, but power, love, and a sound mind. And, you know, he left the office, and, and I didn't see him again. But I started thinking about how many men and how many women need a sound mind. We don't even realize it. Like a couple weeks ago, I got hurt in the, in the ocean, and, and we were out of town on vacation, and I was in the Pacific Ocean, and this wave crashed me to the shore. I had a concussion, and I woke up on the shore. Thank God I didn't die in the ocean. It pushed me back on the beach, and when I woke up and came to my senses, I was throwing up. I had vertigo. Everything was spinning upside down, and I couldn't hear out of this ear. And, and here, here I am two weeks later, I'm still believing God that I'm getting my hearing restored fully, 100%. It's coming back in Jesus' name. It's not there yet, but it's coming. But, and by the way, the last couple of weeks, I've had people come and try to spit in my ear and stick their finger in my ear trying to heal it. I'm all good if you just pray for me at a distance. Just let me know you're praying for me. I don't need any more spit in my ear. Everybody wants to be the guy that healed Pastor Paul. All right, just... It's coming. Jesus is going to do it. But when I went to the doctor, the doctor said, this is going to be a process. It's going to take some time. It, it won't happen overnight. And um, I said, Hi, I, I need this to be fixed immediately because I need my hearing fully restored right now. And they said, okay, you know, we, we can't make that happen. It does itself heals and, and it will take some time, but it's going to heal from the inside out. It's going to start in the inner ear. There's some things that got in there when you went through the crash. There's some things that got in there that are going to have to get out over time. And the drainage is going to look ugly at times. There's going to be some drainage that looks ugly. <laughs> and sure enough, it has. And, and Ashley's like, okay, we need to clean the pillow because your ear is draining on the pillow. And <laughs> I'm grossing y'all out right now. But you know, part of the healing and the deliverance process is ugly. And we don't like to talk about it. But that's the only way that impure spirits come out. That's the only way that thoughts and minds get healed is when you allow Jesus to drain the swamp that's in your mind. Come on, somebody say, drain the swamp. There's some stuff that's gotten in there. And I wonder when it started for this man. Most of the time, it starts at a young age when we walk through trauma, when we walk through hurts and wounds, and we open the door to certain things. And, and when our minds get filled with all kinds of hurts and wounds, and, and, and we don't know what to do with it, we start searching for a cure. We start looking for something to fix our pain. And most of the addictions that are in people's lives can be traced back to wounds from their childhood. We, we look for things, things to try to satisfy, things, for, things to try to escape the hurts and the pains. And, and whether it's addictions to drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever it might be, all of that stuff is just an external it, it, it's a false cure. It's a prescription that won't really satisfy the soul. Men are searching for, for, uh, for a cure to why they don't feel like men. There are men in our world right now who have lost their masculinity. They've lost their ability to be a man, and they're searching for a cure. And that pain of feeling rejected by their father, disapproved, disconnected, left without a dad, that we go searching for meaning. Even in the best homes, even growing up with a father, there's a search for validation, a search for affirmation. And for this man, he would go to the tombs. He would go to the dark places. What dark places has your mind been going lately? People said during the pandemic that there was a resurfacing of mental, emotional health issues that just skyrocketed and that there was a greater level of, of suicidal thoughts and, and, and just depression and things happening in homes because there was this darkness in the world. People started going to dark places in their mind, fighting depression, fighting thoughts of, of, of should I even be alive anymore? Angry, violent imaginations begin to surface. 
And the devil is in no hurry to take your life out if he can just get in your mind. If he can just control you like a puppet on a string, he goes into the thoughts and he sets up strongholds. What we see in this story is that this man has no name. He has 20 verses about his life. He's mentioned in, in three out of the four gospels, but we never hear his name. There are other stories in scripture that have much shorter amount of scripture, and you hear the name of J. Iris. You see the name of, of Pontius Pilate. You see certain names, Bartholomew, and yet they have very little scripture about their life. And yet in this story with 20 scriptures, his name is never mentioned. All he is called by his community is the demoniac, the insane man. But Jesus came to tell you that you are not what you suffer from. You are not defined by your diagnosis. Your, your name is not attached to the labels that people have put on you. And even though everyone else might say he's the alcoholic, Jesus says, no, he's the mighty man of God. Even though others might say he's the porn addict, he's the cocaine addict, Jesus says, no, he's a candidate for a miracle and deliverance and breakthrough. And he has a name and he's a child of God. See, the devil wants us to believe that our identity is tied to our diagnosis, that I am what I do, and what I do is who I am, that my condition, my hurts, my wounds, my past defines who I am. But you are not what you've done, and you are not what others have done to you. You are a child of God. In Jeremiah 6, verse 14, it says, they, they treat the wounds of man with superficial treatments. They offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wounds. I think that's so interesting. The prophet Jeremiah, he was speaking about how Israel had gotten to a place where they were trying to cover things up with Band-Aids, trying to fix mortal wounds with superficial treatments. That's kind of what, what people did during this time with this man who was, who was going insane. He had lost his mind. He was demon-possessed, and what they tried to do was just contain him. Just try to change his habits a little bit. Just give him a quick formula. Just give him a book. Give him a list of rules, do's and don'ts. But this man needed an encounter with Jesus. You don't get healed until you get whole and you get real with God. And God cannot heal a person who lives in denial. This man had to come to Jesus in order to get set free. There's a lot of people who live in that denial place. That masquerade place. Well, I'm not that far on the spectrum. This is for the people who are, who are struggling with suicide. But what about those of you who can't sleep at night because of the voice in your head? That voice in your head that tells you you didn't do enough. You're not enough. You don't measure up. That's not God's voice. That's an impure spirit that's trying to set up a stronghold in your mind. That insomnia, that, that robbing you of peace and sleep, that's not God's will for your life. What if God could move you closer to a stable mind where you were able to sleep good at night? Were you able to fall asleep and wake up the next morning with confidence? Where you stopped questioning every time someone gave you a compliment, whether or not they were just doing it to be nice or having pity for you, but you truly believed in who God had called you to be? What if we could walk in a right mindset? That's God's plan for our life. And, and the only way we do that is when we encounter Jesus. So when he sees Jesus from a distance, he runs and he falls on his knees in front of him and he shouts at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus? Son of the most high God, in God's name, don't torture me. And Jesus spoke to him, come out of this man. He separates the man from the diagnosis and he speaks to the diagnosis. He says, you are not him. He had a life before you showed up. He had a purpose before the enemy. You had a purpose before hell could try to mess with you. You had a purpose before you got abused by your dad. You still have a purpose. You, got, you had a purpose before you got raped. You had a purpose before you walked through the trauma. Is it okay to be real on Father's Day or you guys want me to be fake this weekend? Is it okay if we peel off the mask and just talk straight to the mind of people? Maybe the reason we can't trust anybody is because we haven't been healed by the person who broke trust with us when we were a kid. Maybe the reason we just question everybody's motives is because we aren't living with a stable mind. Somewhere we open the door. And you may not be in the dark place, but you're definitely not in the light. 
And Jesus speaks to the diagnosis. He speaks to the trauma. He speaks to the, the stress. He speaks to the molestation. He speaks to the hurts, the wounds, the memories of, of what this guy had walked through when he was seven years old. And, he, and he, if the man was over here, Jesus walks over to the spirit and he says, you don't belong in him any longer. Jesus has authority to cast out every demonic spirit. He has authority over hell. He has authority over the devil. He has authority over all demonic activity. And he says, stop messing with this man. Because it's not just hurting him, it's hurting his whole family. It's been messing with his marriage. It's been messing with his kids. It's been messing with his relationship with others. He's been living in isolation because he opened the door to you at a young age. The man would run from community. An unhealed mind can't stay in community. An unhealed mind isolates herself, isolates himself. Nobody understands me. Nobody knows the pain I'm going through. Nobody can, can fully grasp what I've walked through. And the second we start believing those thoughts, we start distancing ourselves from the church and from community. We start hiding in dark places. He would go to the tombs. And I was thinking about what tombs people go to today. The tombs represented dead things, things that were no longer exist. They were no longer alive. See, the enemy wants us to revisit things from our past that have died, and, and God's saying, let it die, let it go, move forward. But the enemy tries to pull us back to the graveyard of past mistakes, regrets, things that we did, things that others did, things that your dad did, things that he didn't do. And, and this man would revisit those tombs on a daily basis crying out. And Jesus says, leave this man. And then Jesus asks the spirit, what is your name? And the spirit that's manifesting out of this man says, legion, we are many. Legion represented a, a large uh, group of soldiers. When the Roman Empire ruled the world, they would send a legion into a certain community, and they would change the culture. A legion would be up to a 1,000 soldiers, uh, a fleet of soldiers that would go into certain areas as Rome was taking over Israel and Syria and all the countries around it. They would send in a legion, and the legion would set up strongholds, literally, and then from those strongholds, they would begin to change the culture and, and teach the people the Roman ways and how Romans did things. So this demonic activity that had happened in this man's mind had set up strongholds, and they had changed his behavior. They had changed his decisions. They had taken control of his entire life. And, and again, if, if the mind is not right, everything flows out of the mind. The mind is the engine for the decisions of your life. And here they are dictating his movements, dictating everything he does. And Jesus calls it out. He says, who are you? Legion, we are many. I wonder what voices are in your head right now. What voices have been talking you out of who God's called you to be? What voices have been dictating your movements? I, I asked our graphic artist this weekend to, to put a picture of a mind behind me with all the different labels and negative thoughts that would try to sit in an unhealed Mind. So behind me, you could see anxiety, you see phobia, stress, shame, anger, envy, inadequacy, insecurity, unforgiveness, not good enough, judged on a regular basis, father wound, all of these things fill up the mind. And when we allow those things to sit there long enough, it starts dictating our behavior. We start taking out our pain on everyone around us. And then we take it out on ourselves. And Jesus comes right in and says, this is not my calling for your life. This is not my will for your mind. And the demons begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. This is an interesting part of the scripture. As the demons began to beg Jesus again and again, a large herd of pigs was feeding in the nearby hillside. And as I was reading the scripture last night, it dawned on me we were doing a hot dog cookout after service. And nobody wanted to eat hot dogs after church last night. But I just, I want to encourage you that the demons are not in the hot dogs anymore. The pork is okay. You can have ribs today at Rib Crib, whatever you need. Uh, God's redeemed it. Thank you, Jesus. We live on the other side of the, of the cross, and he rose from the grave. <laughs> but the demons begged Jesus, send us into the pigs. Allow us to go there. He has authority to send these demons anywhere he wants, and he gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out, went into the pigs, and the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and they were drowned. 
Why is that important? Why would I share that part of the scripture? Why didn't I skip over that and keep going? Because the pigs represented the economy of the town. See, some people are more attached and concerned about looking wealthy and having all the external things good than they care about getting their soul healed. More people would rather continue pretending in America to have it made and have the American dream and be the perfect church couple and appear like all is well and post all the good stuff on Instagram. They care more about the pigs than they care about being healed on the inside. These people get angry about their pigs. Watch what happens next. Those who were tending the pigs ran off in anger and they told the whole town how Jesus messed up their pig business. And the people went out to see what had happened. They didn't care about the man who got healed. They cared about their business being messed with. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. I want to underline that. I'm going to come back to that. He was in his right mind and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs as well. And the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. The people cared more about their pigs than the man that would be healed. Don't let your pride of being something great and appearing great in the eyes of people hold you back from being healed on the inside. What, what profit is it if a man gains the whole world but loses his soul? Sometimes you have to let go of the pigs to be healed in the heart. Sometimes you have to let go of looking perfect in front of everyone in the church to finally become mentally and emotionally stable. You have to stop worrying about what people think and what the economy looks like and say, God, I need healing in my house. I need healing in my mind. We need healing in our community. I want the keys to come up. I want to give you four ways that Jesus sets the mind right. Number one, he heals the mind with his presence. The presence of Jesus, I think, is one of the most powerful weapons against mental and emotional unhealthiness. The presence of Jesus is the most powerful weapon against demonic activity. Because when Jesus shows up, the demons have to flee. When, when Jesus shows up, the demons no longer have authority. Like, this is why people run to the church when things are not well in their life. Because there's something about getting into the presence of God that, that just brings a sense of safety, a sense of freedom, a sense of, 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 of just protection from the enemy. The presence of Jesus is more powerful than the presence of any demonic activity in your house. But you know, the presence of Jesus is not contained to a church building. In the Old Testament, it was contained in the temple, in the Ark of the Covenant. But in the New Testament, Jesus said, I can come and live in the temple of your heart, for your body is the temple of the living God. And I can invite the presence of Jesus into my bedroom. I remember one night I couldn't sleep. I was having nightmares, and I could just feel I had, I had made a mistake, done something I shouldn't have done. And I just felt so attacked with condemnation, so much shame. Uh, this was when I was a single, and I just remember feeling so much shame. I could, I could almost feel like a demonic presence in the room. I couldn't see anything, but I could just feel this laughter. Like, I got you now. I got you now. You're mine. You messed up. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be holy. You'll never be righteous because you slipped up. You messed up. And I could just feel the accuser, the condemnation in the room. And I kept praying, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, I just want to go to sleep. I just, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter how many times you say you're sorry. If you don't believe in the mercy of God, it all has to happen in the mind. You have to have a revelation, an encounter with the blood of Jesus Christ that is more powerful than the sins of mankind that sets a man's mind free from feeling condemnation. And by the way, a condemned mind is an unhealthy mind. If you think condemning a man is going to make him a better man, you're sending him down a, a, another path of just continual further into a dark spectrum of, of, of tombs and cutting himself. If you think condemning a woman is going to make her a better, you don't heal a person's mind by accusing and pushing them further down to, to smell their own poop, to say, hey, you really, 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 really need to know how bad you missed it. 
The only way we heal people is through mercy and compassion. His mercy leads me towards repentance. His kindness draws me towards his side. This might be a little too deep. I, I just feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to some people. You can't heal a person's behavior by constantly kicking them and telling them how bad they've missed it. We tried to bind him, Jesus. We put chains on him, and he broke the chains free. Every time the community tried to contain the insane man, he got worse and worse. This is what happens when we try to make religion the cure, the prescription. How bad you missed it. You got to pay for your sins. Penance. Pay up. Pay up. Jesus paid it all on the cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago. That's not a permission slip to live in sin. That is, that is your forgiveness and your sanctification and your justification. My righteousness is filthy rags when I try to pay for my own sin. I continue to live on a treadmill of religion in the chains of bondage, of condemnation. But once I put my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, in the presence of Jesus who died on the cross for my sins, I start moving out of the spectrum of an unhealed mind towards a healthy, stable mind. I start walking in more mercy for people. I stop being less judgmental towards people. I stop kicking other people who are down. I start lifting people up. I become a healthy man in the church. I become a gentleman in my home. Why? Because the mercy of God leads me towards repentance. His kindness draws me into a stable mindset. Notice that Jesus doesn't kick the insane man. He speaks to the spirit, not to the man. He doesn't say, you failure. He says, hey, spirit that's been making this man, hey, spirit, you can't, you can't mess with this man anymore. The presence of Jesus sets the mind. There's something about going into the presence of Jesus that begins to, to heal the mind. When we worship, there's healing that flows during worship. There's healing that flows when we begin to worship Jesus, when we invite his presence into our house. When your house feels dark, you need to go in your house and you need to just start asking for the presence of Jesus to come into the room. Just turn on Hillsong worship music. No, turn on victory worship music. Come on. Turn on that latest victory worship song. Turn on when I speak your name. Turn on he's still on the throne. And as you start listening to those worship songs in your house and you just say, Lord, I just thank you right now. God, that condemnation has to go. Fear has to go. Addictions have to go. Oppression has to go. Depression has to go. Suicidal thoughts have to go. Strife has to go. The presence of Jesus just begins to drive out impure spirits. He heals with his presence. Number two, it's the words of Jesus that, that set the mind right. The words of Jesus. He speaks. He speaks the word. By his stripes you are healed. He speaks the word. As I speak the word of Jesus, I have the mind of Christ. I've not been given a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. At a young age, my mom and dad taught me to listen to the words of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I would just meditate on scripture. Anytime I was sick or anytime I was going through a trial of any kind, I would find like old audio cassette tapes or CDs. Come on, how many of y'all remember the CDs and cassettes? Now it's on your phone. You can just listen to the Bible on the Victory app. You can listen to scripture meditation right there on YouTube. You can listen to the scriptures of meditation of, of, of just faith-filled Bible verses. And as you begin to allow the words of Jesus to infiltrate the strongholds that the enemy has set up in your mind, listen, the battlefield for your destiny is between the ears. You want to fulfill your dreams? You want to be who God's made you to be? You got to work in the mind. We got to do some mind work because there's mind games that the enemy's trying to play. He's trying to stir up a brainstorm. He's trying to get you in a brain freeze right now. He's trying to freeze those thoughts. He's trying to freeze a movie in your head that's, that's, that's negative, that's dark, that's twisted, that's messed up, that's angry, that's all kinds of imaginations. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, we demolish every stronghold of the enemy that has set up camp in our thoughts. And we take captive every thought that's not from God. And we begin to drain the swamp. We begin to pull out the ugly stuff. Listen, just because you had a bad thought doesn't mean you're a bad person. Just because you have some bad thoughts does not make you a sinner. The enemy tries to send those bad thoughts. You don't have to let them sit in your mind. You can begin to drain them. It's okay when you, when, when, when you feel like, hey, am I a bad guy? I just had this crazy thought. No, just don't let, don't let it sit there. Get it out. Get it out. 
Ask the, let the word of Jesus come in. Number three, the deliverance of Jesus. How does he set the mind right? The deliverance. There's things that, that only the deliverance of Jesus. And listen, people will try to tell you, you got to take this. Oh, he just, need, he just needs a little bit of Xanax and we'll fix that stress. He just needs a little bit of, uh, of this medicine and we'll fix that depression. And this will, And I, I believe in practical medicine, but there are some things that medicine cannot cure. The medicine cannot cure a broken heart of a man. The medicine cannot cure what, what they did to you when you were seven years old in the garage. The, the medicine is not going to fix things that only the Holy Spirit, an encounter with Jesus, the deliverance of Jesus, sets you free. I remember talking to my friend Jamie when we were in college. I saw her come down to an altar call here at Victory. I saw her weeping. I was friends with her brother. We lived on the same floor. And I asked my, my, my friend Mark, I, he, her brother, they were twins. I said, what's going on with your sister? He said, ah, oh, it's a long story. He said, you can ask her if she wants to tell you. So I went up to Jamie later on that week when I saw her at the cafeteria at, at ORU. And I said, Jamie, I saw you at the altar. I hardly ever see you at Victory. What happened? She said, your dad was preaching on forgiveness. And uh, I hated the whole message. And I was like, oh. She said, because it convicted me. He was reading my mail. She said, I opened the door to unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is an impure spirit. Legion, we are many. You open the door to stress, anger, pride. They hurt me. He should have been there for me. He wasn't there like the other girls' fathers were there. He never hugged me, never said I love you. And, 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 and she opened the door to unforgiveness towards her dad at a young age. She said, um, my dad left me and my brother and my mom when I was like six years old. And we found out he had a second family that he had been hiding from us. He had other kids and he chose the other family instead of us. She said, so every year on my birthday, I would write him a letter hoping he would come back home to our family and choose us because I knew uh, we, we, we had found out all the story that he had hidden this other family. And she said, every year on my birthday, I'd write him a letter and tell him how my year was, what had happened and how I was going into fourth grade, fifth grade and, and that we missed him. And I was hoping he would come home someday and, and remarry mommy and that we would all be a family again. And, she said, every year I wrote a, a letter, and the letter would be four to five pages long, sometimes 10 pages, because I told him everything. And she said, uh, just this last month, I turned 21 years old, and I finally heard back from my dad. I haven't heard from him um, since I was six, since he left us. He never wrote me back, but he just wrote me back. And she said it was a big, big envelope that came in the mail, and it was every single letter I had ever written him. And he said... Jamie, I got your letters. Here they are. Don't ever contact me again. And she said, I wept in that mail room at ORU. And I started imagining the most violent, angry thoughts towards him. I just wanted him to die. I needed him to die immediately. He did not deserve to live. He does not deserve my forgiveness. And she said, I was so angry. And then your dad preached on forgiveness. And she said, I wanted to leave the entire time. I wanted to get up and walk out of the room, but I felt like the Lord was speaking to me that just because my dad's mind was not right does not mean that I have to repeat that same curse in my mind. You see, just because you grew up with a man whose mind wasn't right and he inflicted all the wounds that he hated himself for and he, he poured it out on you doesn't mean you got to repeat it to yourself. Your mind can be healed even if his mind doesn't get healed. You, you can break the generational curse in your family. She said, I went down to that altar as a step of faith. She said, it's going to take me a process, but I've started to forgive him. And she said, I, I, I already feel lighter. I already feel like I'm, I'm moving towards a healthier me as I'm forgiving each, each thing that he, he wasn't there for. He wasn't there. He wasn't there when I graduated. He wasn't there. He wasn't there when I got my driver's license. He wasn't there when I turned 12. He wasn't there when I needed him to be there. And she said, but I'm forgiving him. I'm forgiving him. I'm forgiving him. And man, I could just feel the freedom flowing. See, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping for someone else to die. Unforgiveness is locking yourself in a prison that you hold the keys while the other people walk free. And she said, I am unlocking myself out of this prison. I'm getting free today. I've changed my mind. I am no longer going to live in the stronghold of bitterness. I am no longer going to let unforgiveness and imaginary murderous thoughts to just take up root in my mind towards my dad. I am letting, I am moving forward. I am forgiving. You could feel the freedom. That's deliverance. 
Jesus is going to do that for you today. The deliverance of Jesus. Number four, it's the purpose of Jesus that sets the mind right. We've looked at all the negative things in the mind, but I want to flip it before I end this sermon. What would it look like to have a right mind? To be free from the stress, the anger. See, God wants to move you from, from living in anger and stress and strife and defensive posture and, and suspicious about everyone. He wants you to move into a place of blessed Blessed coming in, blessed going out, thankful. See, a, a thankful mind has no space for a stressed mind. A, a grateful mind has no space for bitterness. He wants you to move into confident, strong. You're a mighty man of God. You have what it takes. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He wants you to move into a healed mindset, a merciful mindset. He wants you to move into a forgiven mindset, a joyful mindset. See, God wants to change your mind today. He wants to heal the minds of, of people in the room who don't even know that they, they've, they've drifted on the spectrum towards things that are unhealthy. They've drifted towards the tombs of past wounds. And Jesus says, I'm calling you out of the graveyard. Dead man, come out of that grave. Loose him. Bind. Let, let, take off the chains. Take off the grave clothes. Get this man a new suit. So the people saw this man, and he was dressed, and he was in his right mind. As Jesus was getting into the boat, verse 18, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. This is the final screw that Jesus is going to turn. This is the purpose of Jesus. Four ways that he heals the mind. The presence of Jesus, the words of Jesus, the deliverance of Jesus, and the purpose the purpose is the last screw. This man is convinced that his purpose is out there. He says, I've been healed. Now i got to start my ministry because I'm only significant if I'm preaching with Jesus. I'm only significant if I'm a missionary on the mission field. I'm only significant if I'm doing what Peter's doing. And Jesus says, here's, here's the final French fry I need to put in your Happy Meal. Here's the final screw I need to tighten here. I need to get you on this spectrum. You are so valuable not because of what you do, but because of what I've done for you. You going on a missions trip is not going to make you more significant. You traveling on this boat with Peter and preaching in Jerusalem is not going to make you more valuable. He looks at him and he says, son, look at what he says in verse 19. New Living Translation. He says, son, go home to your family. Your greatest ministry is right in front of you. Your best days are not out there. They're right here, right now. You see, a stable mind, a mind that's rightly screwed in, doesn't look at people and, and see what they have and go, I wish we had kids. I wish I was married. I wish I was doing that preaching stuff like they're doing. I, if I was doing what he was doing, I'd be significant. A stable mind says, I'm doing my best work right here, right now. God's up to something good. He's using the healing he started in my mind to flow out of me for the people that are right in front of me, in my workplace, in my home, with my family. Go home, he says. Go home and show your family the new you. Because when you heal one man's mind, you can heal an entire family. When you heal one man's mind, you can heal an entire family. I want you to stand your feet all over this place. I believe Jesus wants to heal some minds today. When you heal the mind, you start healing multiple spots. Scientists have said that a, a, a mind that is in a healthy place can actually produce healing for the body. What happens when the mind gets healed? I looked at some interesting stories on the mind. Dr. Walter Cannon, a famous Harvard Medical School psychologist, documented that in New Zealand, the Aborigines, they have a, um, a rule that Aborigines are not allowed to eat wild hen. This is an interesting story. And there was a young Aborigine who was traveling. He stopped in the home of an older friend who wasn't an Aborigine. For breakfast, the friend prepared a meal consisting of wild hen, but did not tell this young Aborigine. This was a food strictly forbidden for those who were young in, in their culture. And the young man demanded to know if there was wild hen in the meal. And his host said no. He ate and he departed. 20 years later, they met, and the older friend asked him if he would now eat wild hen. He said, now that I've grown up in, my, in our culture, they allow the older aborigines to eat wild hen. But he said, I, I'm not going to do it because I believe it causes people sickness and it causes them to die. The older man laughed and told him 
how he had tricked him into eating this forbidden food of wild hen when he was 18 years old. When the young man heard this, he became extremely frightened. Within 24 hours, he was dead. No disease, no germs, no virus, but his mind was convinced that he had to die because he believed in the power of what he had seen and what he had heard. The mind can do some crazy things. Norman Cousin in his book, The Healing Heart, tells of a football game where several people became suddenly ill. True story. A public announcement was made over the stadium that, made, uh, that told people no more soft drinks from the beverage machines were to be consumed until the cause of the sickness was determined. When everyone in the stadium heard that, immediately the effect was that people all over the stadium became ill because they thought, I drank from that beverage machine. Hundreds of people were hospitalized. Local ambulances and private cars were hauling people to five local hospitals. Tons of people went to their own doctor. Later that next week, laboratory analysis showed that nothing was wrong with the water or the syrup. And when this was announced, there was a sudden healing of everyone who had become ill. Their minds made them sick. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. So when you think sick, you start living sick. This is just one episode of a long series of historical incidents which reveal how the mind can make people sick. Mass hysteria all through history has made people ill. It makes me think, I totally believe that there was a real virus last year, COVID-19, but how much have our minds blown up a virus to be bigger than it actually is? And, and how much of our minds have convinced ourselves of things that aren't really true about people, about sicknesses, See, a right mind does not live with crazy fear and assumptions about everybody. A right mind is not walking around suspicious all the time, angry all the time, accusing people all the time, judgmental all the time. That's not right. A right mind lives with love, knowing that he or she is loved. And they live with, with, with a, a belief in God and people. I mean, there's, you can tell when someone's in their right mind. It's, it, there's a peace there's, there's, there's a true tranquility. There's a true maturity that's not walking around with, with constant hysteria and phobia about so many things. And, and, and as I kept reading, this is another interesting thing. Um, there was a doctor who believed that the healings that Jesus did in the Bible, a lot of them connected with the mind. Like when Jesus spit in the man's ears, the man who was mute and deaf, and last week someone tried to spit in my ears. But when someone did that and they were healed, when Jesus did that and they were healed, he said, I've done the same thing to cancer patients, telling them, if I do this, this will be a part of your healing, and it's actually caused healing in cancer patients. He said, I agree that not only spit can heal a deaf, a mute person, but even he heals cancer. I'm absolutely convinced Dr. Bernie Siegel, a cancer specialist who wrote a book called Love, Medicine, and Miracles. He said, I'm absolutely convinced that if I recommended eating three peanut butter sandwiches a day, some people would do it and they would get well from an incurable cancer. The reason is not because of peanut butter or spit or chemotherapy or anything else, but because the mind can by any means be convinced and lead to healing if a person accepts it in their mind. That's why there's a thousand ideas about how to cure cancer. There's somebody who's been healed by every strange means because they believed it. The mind and the body worked together and won the battle. How important is it to have a right mind, a healed mind, a healthy, emotional, mental, stable mind? It is a gift from God. Your mind is God's gift. And when a man's mind gets healed, his family gets healed. People who believe they're going to get sick start convincing themselves. Um, it's a mint, there's, such a, there's such a power connected to the mind. When, when God brings healing to your mind, it starts affecting every decision, every relationship, every intention. It starts affecting your belief patterns. Jesus told these, these blind men in Matthew 9, verse 27, who, who, were, who were blind, he says, become what you believe. If you believe it's possible, it can happen according to your faith. Today, God is bringing healing to your mind. He's, he's, he's healing your mind, as a man thinketh, with heads bowed and eyes closed all over this room. If you're here today and you say, I need healing in an area in my mind, I want you to raise your hand all over this room if that's you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Could be stress. Could be unforgiveness. Could be just trauma that you've, you've just had a hard time letting go of. Hands going up all over this room. The enemy's been trying to stir up depression. He's been trying to stir up inadequacy, insecurity that, that you thought you would let go of. And then it's just come right back again. And today, Jesus says, I can heal that. I can heal that. I can heal that. I can touch that. I can change your mind in that area. 
I know it's past the time that we normally dismiss, but I just feel the Holy Spirit wants to move right now. And if you raised your hand or you wanted to raise your hand, I want you to just leave your seat. Come and join me at this altar right now on this Father's Day weekend. Come to the great physician. Come to the great counselor. Come to the great psychiatrist. Come to the one who understands the mind because he created it. He is the one who understands what's going on in your heart, your emotions, your mental health. And he says, I see that and I can heal that. I can change that. Where the enemy has set up a stronghold, Jesus says, I'm gonna help you win in that area. I'm going to bring victory in that area. All over this place, if you just need healing in any area of your mind, come down to the altar. And I want us just to worship as we come down here. Just fix your eyes, fix your thoughts on Jesus healing you right now. Yeah. He's healing the wound between you and your mom. He's healing the wound between you and yourself. Fifteen years ago called Healer and it's one of the most powerful worship songs I'd ever heard at the time and 
the story was that the guy who wrote it was battling cancer and then a couple months later it came out the big scandal that he actually didn't have cancer he was pretending to have it but then the, the story that came out was that he was mentally and emotionally very ill and his whole family came out and said it, that he had been battling lots of, of suicidal thoughts and and at first people asked me are we still going to sing that song now that the story came out and i said that's that's so powerful because the song is not just healing for the body it's healing for the mind even though this man was not in his right mind when he was imagining and pretending and I, I don't care how righteous you come across all of us have a little bit of areas where we just pretend we just need jesus and i said we got to sing that song because that man needs healing in his mind and we're going to believe god for it and there's a lot of us that need healing in our mind and hearts just as much as our bodies and and the chorus was i believe that you're my healer i believe that you're my healer nothing is impossible when I talk with people in our church, one of the things they've said is, you know, Paul, I appreciate that you touch on depression, that you touch on not just healing the body, but healing the mind and heart, because that's where a lot of people suffer in our, in our current generation. That's where a lot of people are hurting, is they need a mental and emotional healing. And I've experienced that in my life, because I battled some stuff. When my father passed, I mean, there was strongholds that the enemy was trying to set up there that I just needed Jesus to heal me of. And I'm so thankful if it had not been for the mercy of God, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be standing on this stage. I'd be six feet under the ground from poor choices that, that the enemy was trying to stir up in my head. But I'm telling you today, the healing power of God is here for your mind, for your mind, for your brain. And I just hear the Lord saying, I'm going to come to the left side of the brain. And where there's been some strongholds there, I'm about to... I'm about to drain the swamp and I'm gonna to come to the right side of the brain and, and, and I'm gonna to come to the areas that don't make sense to you and only scientists and medical doctors would be able to, to show you through, through some sort of a machine what's going on in your brain, but even then they can't show you what the enemy's been trying to stir and I'm coming in there and I'm cleaning house and I'm fixing some things and I'm setting some things right and I'm healing you of some, some trauma that's been set up in there and I'm beginning to, to teach you how to live with trust even, even when you've walked through betrayal, I'm going to teach you how to trust again. I'm going to teach you how to not be so defensive. I'm going to teach you how to assume the best. I'm going to teach you how to walk with hope. Even when you've, you've walked through situations where your hopes were hurt. Yeah, he's, he's bringing healing to the mind right now. Just put your hand on your head for a moment. And just say, I have the mind of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for healing my mind. I've not been given a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Satan, you have no authority over my mind. Fear, you got to go. Stress, you got to go. Anger, you got to go. Every stronghold is being broken. I have the mind of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for healing my mind. I have the victory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give him praise this morning. Hey, one last thing before we leave. Before we leave today, I know we've lingered longer, but if you're here today and you haven't given your heart to Jesus and you want to do that with every head up, every eye open, if that's you, just raise your hand today. I want to celebrate anyone who's saying, I surrender, I'm repenting, I'm getting things right with God. What a great gift on Father's Day to do that. I want us all to say this together. Say, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the grave. I'm all yours. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We love you. God bless you.